Well, joining me now, he needs no introduction, or as perhaps his good friend Donald might say, Mr Brexit, the face of the Brexit campaign, former Brexit party leader and now fellow GB News presenter Nigel Farage. And, of course, my ex-boss. <laughs> Thank you. Nigel, I mean, we're taking stock on this, you know, bank holiday Monday to look at where we're at with Brexit. And it's been a bit difficult because you've had these sort of overlying strata of the effects of the pandemic. So it's kind of harder to identify what the effects of Brexit are. Where do, yes. you, where do you think we're at? Is, well, is it going better than you expected? Let's take the big picture. The big picture is we vote for something in 2016. Uh, it's a shock result because the pollsters don't pick it up. No one thinks it's going to happen. Uh, and despite the most incredible campaign of negativity, telling us, you know, that the sky's going to fall in, we're all going to be, you know, living in caves. Despite all of this, we vote to leave. I think what happened for the next three or four years was, in democratic terms, the worst thing that's ever happened in our country. You know, a wholesale attempt by large sections of the media many in Parliament and elsewhere, to try and effectively stop the result of the referendum. And, and that's where the bitterness came from. That was where the real rancour came from. Uh, and people who'd voted Brexit uh, being portrayed to be these knuckle-draggers, that it was, you know, we were, we were all the most awful people, we didn't know what we voted for, I and mean, all this, this condescension, this patronising behaviour. So the big picture is, the war is over. Thank goodness for that. It's done. You know, we've left. There is no going back. There's now a large, settled majority behind Brexit. And literally every day I meet people who say, I voted Remain, but because of the way they've behaved ever since, I would now, if there was another referendum, vote to leave. So we're about 70% now that say it was the right thing to do. So the big picture is we're out. It's great. We're now an independent country, which means... We now have the right to mismanage our own future or, or, or to get it right. I never pretended for 25 years that just because we left the European Union, everything would be solved, our problems would be over. What I said was we would be the masters of our own destiny. Well, that is so that, that's the big picture, Alex. <laughs> you know, that's the big picture. Now, if you want to get down to detail, the problem is the Brexit deal was always a dreadful deal. Mm. You know, Mrs May's surrender package that she came back to checkers with, that saw the resignation of David Davis, the Brexit secretary. Mm. Then, after he'd found out which way the wind was blowing, Boris resigned too. Um, and what we got was another Brexit deal. But it wasn't... It was different, and it was better than the first deal. And if I was being kind to Boris, I'd say, look, he was given a very bad hand of cards by Mrs May. So, in the end, the price that was really paid was Northern Ireland. Mm. Northern Ireland is now effectively a foreign country. It's been annexed away from the UK. Mm -mm. I found out today... I didn't know this. I found out today, if you want to take your dog on the ferry from England to Northern Ireland, it now costs you 180 quid mm. to move your dog within the United Kingdom. It's one little example yeah. that perhaps strikes home to people. So Northern Ireland cut off. A shocking fisheries deal. Uh, we're still giving away 40 billion sterling. Uh, for, the, and for the next 38 years. Right, yeah, we, we're we still barely talk away, about that. We're still paying away sums of money. Um, we've got no sensible agreement with the French on returning illegal migrants across the Channel. So are there downsides to the Brexit deal? Yes, there are. Is there unfinished business, particularly in the case of Northern Ireland? Yes, there is. But against that, what I would say is we're already beginning to see... Uh, the government, Oliver Dowden, for example, the Culture Secretary, over the weekend saying, we're going to amend the messy GDPR regulations, where every time we try and look at a news site, you've got to <laughs> consent to this <laughs> or agree to cookies yeah. or whatever it may yeah. be. It may be a little thing, but it's just one little example of ways in which we can simplify, mm. make life easier, make life better. The other point we're thinking about is, you know, people think perhaps about Morrison's, you know, a very well-known, you know, place where millions of people go and buy their groceries, you know, a big bid coming in for that from overseas, and we're seeing it in the defence sector. I mean, the whole world wants to invest in this country. Mm. That is a vote of confidence in Brexit Britain. So, overall, am I happy with where we are? Well, I, I'd, say I'm, I'd say I'm 75 to 80% happy yeah. with where we are. There is still unfinished business, but overall, 
the fact that the fact we've put this behind us, this shocking period mm. of those three or four years, I think is very good news. Well, don't go anywhere because we're now going to bring in Kate Hoey, who, of course, campaigned from the Labour Party, but campaigned very much to leave and uh, is the authority when it comes to Northern Ireland. Kate, uh, welcome to the show. Uh, looking specifically about what's happened to Northern Ireland, it, it is really the opposite of uh, what, what Brexit has campaigned for, right? Yes, and can I just say I agree with Nigel on almost everything he said, and he did pick up, of course, the Northern Ireland issue, which is the last remaining part, plus fishing, that I feel very strongly about. But um, I think we all kind of know how we got here, that Northern Ireland was sacrificed, because it could have been that we weren't going to get Brexit at all. And, you know, I, I personally couldn't vote for the withdrawal agreement because of Northern Ireland, but I could understand many of my colleagues in the, in the Leave campaign saying we have to do it. Um, I'm still hopeful, uh, perhaps a bit, uh, a bit too hopeful, but hopeful that... Um, well, I do genuinely think that uh, the Prime Minister understands that this cannot continue the way it is. I think he understands that he did make promises to people actually in Northern Ireland, making the promises that, you know, if you get these forms about anything, just tear them up and throw them in the bin. Um, and I think that uh, Lord Frost, since he has come in as the Brexit minister, has been a breath of fresh air and has really gone out of his way to listen to people. My problem with it still is that I think, like in a lot of areas, we're still not prepared as a government to actually uh, you know, take on the European Union. We're far, far, far too nice still. And I think the reality is that they think, the British government thinks that if that if they're nice and they show that they're really trying to solve the protocol difficulties, that if they then do go ahead and invoke Article 16, which was the bit in the agreement that would allow if all these difficulties were happening, to actually um, invoke it and to uh, renegotiate, um, that that will give them a sort of feeling that the international community will say, well, actually, the United Kingdom has been very reasonable. So there's been a lot of that going on behind the scenes. But come the end of September, the grace periods end. We're back to where we were before those were implemented. And issues like, you know, affecting everyone, like bringing your pet, as, as Nigel mentioned, rabies injections, things that, you know, for one part of the United Kingdom to have to have all of that moving to another is just, is just not acceptable. And I think just finally what I'm pleased about now is that I think finally uh, people in England particularly and, of course, in Scotland who are also... Um, I think, you know, more likely to be, feel and understand this, um, are beginning to realise that the protocol has to, has to go. And we're seeing Conservative MPs, I mean, I get them coming up to me when I'm over in the Lords, really feeling, you know, they're quite shamefaced about it now. They understand what's happened and they want to get out of it. So Boris really needs to step up to the mark on this. And in the end, we may have to have a, a pretty big row with the European Union. Yeah, well, let's, let's talk about that and bring in, bring in Nigel. Do you think it's as simple as being able to just scrap the Northern Irish Protocol? Or do you think in order to even just slightly tweak it, the EU is going to want something in return? Well, Ursula von der Leyen was more than happy, wasn't she, at the height of her panic over vaccines to bring back a hard Irish border? I mean, the irony of that seems to have been lost on everyone and been forgotten about. Look, I think at the end of the day, the first job of the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom... Uh, is to maintain the integrity of the country. Uh, and despite public assurances that Boris Johnson gave, that is not the way that it's worked out. Whether he understood that fully at the time, I don't know. Perhaps Northern Ireland was the Barnier poison pill that was there inside the treaty. But as Kate says, for the long term, and particularly given where we're going to be on October the 1st, uh, at some point we are going to have to say, I'm sorry, we can't put up with this. And, of course... The same arguments will come from big business, you mustn't rock the boat, etc. But at some point, Boris Johnson has to stand up for the totality of our national interest. And if that means a great big row, so be it. Yeah, Kate, do you think it's going to be that simple? Do you think we will be able to get our own way as long as uh, the Prime Minister shows conviction over this issue? Or do you think there's a lot of under-the-table negotiations to be had where the EU would say, well, you know, you do X, Y and Z and we're going to do X, Y and Z? Because the Northern Irish Protocol is, in all senses and purposes, now written in ink in, in international law. So it, it's not as simple as just saying, tear it up, start again. 
Well, we have got out of international laws in the past. Um, you know, they're not set in stone. Things change. The world moves on. Countries move on. We're going to see a lot of changes now, given what's happened in Afghanistan with international treaties, I would think. But the, 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 the Article 16 was specifically put in to give uh, opportunity to look again. I mean, the, the process of Article 16 is actually very long winded. And it's not as instant as it would happen. But I think if we were to invoke Article 16, then that would actually send a shockwave to the European Union, if anything shocks them, that we are prepared to do that. Um, I mean, talking about it, and of course, uh, Lord Frost made it very clear that the criteria had been met. So really, we have to say in Northern Ireland, and people are saying, well, look, hang on. The government is saying that we are suffering societal difficulties, we're suffering economic difficulties, environmental difficulties, and they have accepted this. So why are we not invoking it? And I think, um, you know, sometimes these things can be made up to be very, very much more difficult than actually they need be. And the reality is that if the Irish government got behind what was happening and, and accepted and stopped using it as a sort of little bit of a, a political football in terms of the, you know, the whole Ireland political issue. I mean, Brexit should not really have interfered with any of that, but it has. And the Irish government, in cahoots with the European Union, are enjoying that. Now, they could, I think the pressure will come on them as more and more of their citizens are beginning to see that it's actually affecting them. You know, the, the, the diaspora of Irish people in Great Britain is huge and it makes a difference to them too if they're going to have to pay, um, you know, to bring over their pet and all of these issues and not being able to get um, particular uh, bits of, of dairy produce in, in our shops. So I'm all for making it as simple as possible and I'm sorry if it's not working, it's not right, it's not good for Northern Ireland, it's certainly not good for the Union and if Boris Johnson cares about the union as he continually says he does then northern ireland and this the protocol is the place to start to show that he really cares yeah i mean symbolically it was it was a huge deal actually i mean besides being able to move pets around and, and produce essentially we have northern ireland almost under a completely different system of governance to the rest of the uk nigel do you think that was always the intention or do you think the eu were expecting us to climb down when it came to northern ireland and therefore agreed to stay in the customs uh, union agreed to stay in the single market and actually we've kind of called their bluff and now we're in this pickle yeah, yeah. they got theresa may trapped on this didn't they they got yes. Theresa May trapped to the extent that effectively the whole of the United Kingdom would... It, it would have been Brino. It would have been Brexit in name only. That's what Theresa May was prepared to accept. Boris Johnson understood that electorally, you know, the English and large parts of Wales simply would not put up with it. Um, and so rather keep the entirety of the UK trapped inside that system, he let Northern Ireland stay part of that system, which, if one's being frank, in electoral terms to the Conservative Party didn't really make a great deal of difference. So I think that's the reality of what happened here. I think Boris Johnson knew exactly what he was doing, um, and, but I think he thought that was the lesser... I'm being kind now. I think he thought that was the lesser of two evils, uh, but it's not good for Northern Ireland. And, and, and look, you know, people can threaten whatever they like. You know, as, as Kate says, the whole point about the triggering of Article 16 is that it makes the other side understand that we are serious. And it's only when you do that that you're really going to get these people around the negotiating table. And, of course, it won't be Monsieur Barnier, because uh, Monsieur Barnier has moved no. on. He's now <laughs> He's running the French president <laughs> on an anti-immigration ticket. I just make it up. can't <laughs> believe it. I mean, he told me in the coffee room in the, in the Parliament in Strasbourg that I was anti-business and small-minded because I didn't support the free movement of people, and now he's running on the very <laughs> ticket. I mean, you just can't believe it. Well, quite. Now, Kate, uh, just before the referendum, we heard constantly, didn't we? In fact, the EU managed to invoke their friends in America to even turn around and, and point okay. out there will be conflicts again, you know, the Good Friday Agreement will be broken, blood will be running in the streets. And, well, frankly, that hasn't happened. But the cost has been fairly huge for Northern Ireland to essentially almost be annexed by a foreign power. Frankly, that is, you know, it, it, the bare bones of what's gone on. What's the reaction like in Northern Ireland? Are there tempers frayed over this or have people just sort of shrugged their shoulders and said, well, you know, for once for better phrase, say la vie? Well, it's very important that we don't see it as a kind of, um, you know, Catholic Protestant issue. And it's also very important that we don't see it as a, a nationalist unionist issue, because actually, whether you're a nationalist or unionist or Catholic or Protestant, you're still having the same drawbacks of the protocol. 
Obviously, the constitutional issue is more important to those who care about the union. But for ordinary people, whatever their background, their religion, it's affecting them. And they're, so they need to feel, you know, they're feeling quite annoyed about it, even if they might not um, go as far as some people would on it. But the, um, you know, the Americans have played this sort of Irish card. And they keep saying, and it really annoys me when they say, you know, people say, people who should know better, that America was a guarantor of the Belfast Good Friday Agreement. They never were. Um, you know, they were involved a, a bit in terms of bringing people together, but they weren't a guarantor. And I think what we're seeing now is, um, you know, there is division. There's no doubt about it. It's causing people to think about things in a way that maybe they didn't for some time. And uh, again, I just feel, you know, I have to keep going back to this idea that somehow the Belfast Agreement was going to be broken if you had any kind of trade border at the, for at the frontier, which is between Northern Ireland and the Republic, even without cameras extra or anything like that, no structures. And yet it's not broken by having a, a, a similar barrier, uh, the, not actually in, in the Irish Sea, although we call it the Irish Sea border, but actually at Larne and Belfast and, 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 and our other ports. So how that doesn't break the Belfast Agreement, and that's because the reality is of the Belfast Agreement that it's very much pushed by both the Irish government and, and sometimes our own government, that it's all about kind of appeasing the nationalist side and that we well, don't worry about the pro-union side because they're, you know, they're British, they'll be fine, they'll just sit back and take it. Well, you know, we've seen some problems on the streets and particularly some of our young pro-union loyalists now are beginning to say, well, hang on, you know, the threat of violence, which was pushed very strongly, even by the Irish government, Varadka went to the European Union and held up the picture of the customs post. And they're now saying, well, hang on, it looks like violence pays. Now, that's not to say that, you know, they're all going to become violent. But I think we do have to understand why people are feeling so angry and let down as they are. Mm, some dangerous games were very much played uh, over the Irish border during those Brexit negotiations, certainly. Kate, thank you so much for coming on the programme. Fabulous as ever. It's been lovely to have you on. Now, let's speak to another one of those rare beasts, a, a, an elected Labour Brexit backing person. This time it's Brendan Chilton, who actually ran Labour Leave. He's a councillor from Kent and a former parliamentary candidate. Brendan, I know that you have very much one eye on the world of trade, on the world of business, on the EU's future beyond Brexit. During our little appraisal today, what, what sort of marks would you give Brexit out of 10 so far and why? Well, at the moment, uh, first of all, good afternoon, uh, Alex. And uh, I think, uh, first of all, just to say, we've got to bear in mind, we've only been outside the European Union for just over uh, a year and a half. Uh, we left uh, in 2020. We're now coming towards the end of 2021. And we've had a pandemic. And so the government's eyes have been somewhat focused on dealing with the pandemic, I would suggest, rather than actually uh, taking full advantage of being outside the European Union. Um, so I'm going to give it a very modest five or six out of ten, uh, because I don't think yet we've really fully experienced uh, the opportunities available to us. And that is because, uh, to be fair to the government, they have had to deal with this minor issue uh, of a pandemic and, of course, now the crisis in Afghanistan. Um, I say that because we've had very little on the question of regulation. Uh, a lot of the trade deals that we have signed have been ones that we've simply rolled over rather than seeking new and enhanced arrangements. Of course, no one's expecting things to be done immediately, but they, they are rolled over deals. Um, we get this vague concept of global Britain, which means you know getting involved in the Pacific and being good allies with America. I think Britain, particularly following the Afghanistan crisis, needs to really rethink its role in the world and what our capabilities are and if we need to enhance them. I agree with what Kate and Nigel have said, uh, that we have got big problems down the line in Northern Ireland and that October the 1st uh, date is coming and the government can't keep kicking the question of Northern Ireland uh, down the road. It's got to be dealt with at some point. Uh, for me personally, uh, it, Northern Ireland is the same as any English, Scottish or Welsh county or, or Wales or Scotland or England. You know, It would not be acceptable for Kent, uh, where I am, uh, to be annexed by the European Union. Uh, why therefore is it uh, acceptable for another part of our country, uh, Northern Ireland, uh, to be annexed. So for those reasons and for the sort of the uncertain future uh, at the moment, I'm going to sit with a five or six out of ten. 
Now, you mentioned the pandemic. Um, I mean, is it possible, actually, that global lockdown has rather helped some of the fallout from Brexit for being visible? Because we were warned about things like, um, you know, produce finding it difficult coming in and out of the UK. There might be shortages on supermarket shelves, migrant workers going home, leaving huge gaps in, uh, and labour shortages in our economy. I mean, those things are happening is that Brexit? Is that the pandemic? Is that a cocktail? I don't think it is. If I could just uh, comment specifically on this, this current question of shortages, and it's largely down to the fact that we have a national shortage of HGV drivers. Um, I was speaking this morning uh, with the, the head of the National uh, Meat Packing Association, and he was telling us that the issue we've got is a lot of HGV lo uh, lorry drivers are in their very late 50s and early 60s and are at retirement age. And because we've had the pandemic, it's not been possible uh, to train new HGG, HGV drivers uh, in the same way because of all the social distancing rules and all the rest of it. So there is a labour shortage issue here, uh, which is not related to Brexit. Uh, at the start of the pandemic, of course, a lot of people did return to their home countries to be with family because it was a pandemic. And a lot of them are still there precisely because we have travel restrictions. So the shortages we're experiencing are not directly a consequence of Brexit. I would uh, suggest that they are, in fact, much more a result of the pandemic than all the global restrictions uh, that have been put in place upon us. Um, that would be my assessment of that situation in particular. Let's look at one particular angle, which is the wages. I mean, sticking on the jobs market front, being a, a Labour man at heart, it's a very interesting topic because it seemed to me during that referendum, all the arguments being made for staying in the EU were largely made by big business. And the people who seemed to win the referendum on the day was the little man, possibly against the wishes of big business. Do you see that playing out now in the aftermath where we're seeing things like salaries for lorry drivers are going up, the hourly rates to work in hospitality is going up to try and get a domestic workforce back into those jobs? Is that sustainable in the long run? Is that what you would have hoped for, uh, reversing wage compression as a result of foreign migration? Or is this going to eventually have a huge impact on the British economy and the pound in our pockets? Well, of course, we only have so much money in the, the national cape to be divided up amongst salaries and infrastructure and all the rest of it. But the fact that we are seeing wage increases is exactly as a consequence of our leaving the European Union. I remember during the uh, referendum, I went round, uh, I think with both uh, Alex and obviously Nigel, around the country speaking at huge meetings. And we all said uh, that the, you know, if you have a, uh, an endless supply of cheap labour uh, from across Europe, you are going to see wage compression because employers will be able to pay people much cheaper wages because they are prepared to work for a lot less. Uh, we've now got a situation where employers are paying people more money and they can afford to pay people more money and it's right that they're doing so and more british people are getting those jobs of course you, you can't have a, an ever increasing pay scale they've got to be sort of annual limits in accordance to how much money you've made uh, but that is a good thing um we've seen uh, this week uh, several super chain uh, supermarket chains announcing they're going to be increasing wa increasing wages for lorry drivers i've even seen believe it or not articles in The Guardian uh, on occasion that have spoken positively about wage increases for people, particularly on lower incomes. Um, that means, of course, they will have more money to spend in the economy, uh, which, of course, in its turn, will grow the economy. Of course, as we say, this is all happening under the shadow uh, of the COVID restrictions that we've had. Um, and so we haven't necessarily seen the full benefit of that extra spending capacity within the domestic market. Um, we will, however, need to address the question of our labour market in the future. We have an ageing population and uh, the government have already indicated uh, that they're going to be looking at increasing income tax to pay for social care. Well, if we have an ever increasing, ever decreasing, uh, forgive me, uh, labour market in this country and an ever increasing ageing population, you cannot continue to tax fewer and fewer people uh, to pay for more and more services. So we either need to look somehow at increasing our domestic population or looking at countries that have got similar levels of economic development to us and incentivizing skilled people from those countries to come here uh, to meet the jobs and the demands of the future and to help grow our economy.
So I'm going to bring Nigel back in because I think now is a very good time for us all to talk about. Yeah. We created this blank piece of paper when we left the EU on which we now have to decide how we move forward as a nation and what we do with those uh, regained powers. Nigel, what would you like to see this government and successive governments do now to benefit from the Brexit dividend? How, what, should, what would be the top of your plan if you were in charge? Well, this whole debate about foreign workers. Oh, everyone's leaving the country. They've all gone home during the pandemic. <coughs> They're not coming back. Remember in the referendum, the Remain side said there were three million EU citizens living in Britain whose rights must be protected. A few years on, when they had to register, how many registered? Six million. All right? So how many more millions of people do we want? I mean, we can go on just importing foreign labour and foreign skills if we want to. I mean, it'll make getting GP appointments even harder. I mean, that none of our kids can ever buy a house. Or we can look at this differently. Uh, very interesting, isn't it? Massive shortage at the moment of HGV drivers that you've been talking to Brendan about. Um, uh, for example, Pimlico Plumbers saying at the weekend that quite a lot of their guys, one in four people who work for Pimlico Plumbers, will earn more than £150,000 this year. And yet, the employment agencies say that graduates in social sciences are struggling to get jobs. And I'd like to see Brexit used as an opportunity to retrain and reskill not just the young people in this country, but the entirety of the workforce. We should not be reliant on Mali or countries like that for nurses and doctors, where they're probably needed even more than they are uh, you know, you know, in, in, in their home countries. And I think in areas like engineering, you know, in areas like that, where you literally cannot survive as an engineering manufacturer without foreign labour, because we haven't got the skills in this country, Let's use this opportunity to train people to get good, respectable, well-paid jobs. And as I say, not just for young people of university age, but also, what about the retired HGV drivers? Tens of thousands of them out there between 65 and 70 years old. Why are we not incentivising them to come back into the jobs market? Well, give my dad a hip replacement and he'll bite your hand off, I'm telling you. Brendan, just before I have to let you go, what would be top of your wish list for a, a big post-Brexit policy initiative? Uh, for me, I want to see much greater involvement with the Commonwealth. Uh, there's been a huge debate in this country about how much aid we should be giving uh, to developing countries. I would suggest we need to completely switch that debate from how much aid we're giving to how much trade we're engaging on them with. Uh, I see uh, no reason why developing countries should still be subject to huge tariffs in getting their goods into this country uh, if we truly believe in global free trade, I would suggest the best thing we could do is to open our markets, liberalise our markets to those developing countries. And that would also serve as an alternative uh, market for those countries where you've got countries like China and Russia that are getting increasingly involved, uh, particularly in parts of Africa, in the Caribbean and in Asia. And if Britain can be one thing post-Brexit, it's a global trading nation that tries to bring those emerging economies back under the influence of the democratic West as opposed to the authoritarian East. Brendan, Nigel, thank you ever so much for joining me for this debate. There's so much more to talk about, isn't there? We've barely even touched upon education, science.